ballots that are still open for election, which, which is federal, county, and at large. And is the box, do we still have the box here? Okay, so email the UJIC board and for any more nominations. And moderators, if you were a moderator during the conference and you did not present to get one of those cool bags, please come up here and we'll, we got you a bag, okay? And you can come get that probably sooner than later because we might just raffle the rest away. Okay, also we have We have, we have some extra sweaters, okay? And we would raffle them off, but we're not sure you'd fit in which sweater you might get. So if you would like one of these sweaters, we're gonna go first come, first serve. We have these sizes. We have men's 2XL, and we have men's XL, and another men's XL. We also have a ladies XL and a ladies medium, okay? So if you would if you would like one of those, come up and get those. If you want, if you are moderators, come get your bags. And also, if you have a special meal, um, a meal. I don't know what's that called. Vegetarian meal or whatever special meal that you get tonight, this afternoon. Please let the um, wait staff know, and they'll bring you your meal. Otherwise. We don't want to give it to the wrong person. Here, this is. Also, last chance to put your vendor cards your, with this for the raffle in the box because we're going to start doing our raffle after we get finished with our keynote speaker. Good? Awesome. Good job, guys. Okay, so our next section here is going to be Chris. Chris is going to talk, us, talk to us about our scholarship winners for a minute. Okay, I think we should all give Stan a hand for all the work he's done to set the conference up. Thanks, Stan. All right, so can I get our three student scholarship winners, recipients, up on stage, please? Abner, Jesse, and Lena. Where are y'all? Come on up. So while they are coming up, we're, we're missing one. There, there she is, okay. Um, we want to. We really appreciate the hard work um, and of the scholarship winners, awardees this this week. They've all been present. You've seen them working. They've been moderating. They've been helping out with the IT stuff. They've been doing all sorts of stuff. So um, we're really excited this year, and because of your support, the UJIC membership um, in general, um, and the excellent management of the UJIC finances uh, through the years. Uh, thanks to the board and a number of board members that, that have done that. Um, we're, we're now in a position to offer financial scholarships in support of our students. And uh, to that end, this is something that we haven't been able to do in the past just because we haven't been where we are now. And so we're very excited to be able to do this. So as long as, as UJIC is fiscally sound going forward, this is something we'll be able to do for our students. Um, so um, I would like to offer Jesse, Abner, and Lena on behalf of the entire UJIC membership and board, there you go. There you go. Um, we're pleased to award each of you a $500 scholarship for the purpose of furthering your academic endeavors. So please join me in offering our congratulations and thanks to each one of these, these fine folks. So, we've got Melissa taking a couple pictures. Anyway, this is really exciting. We haven't been in this position before, and I think this is just a testament to you know, what UJIC is, and we are here to support the GIS, the geospatial remote sensing, earth observation communities within the state. And thank you all for, for talking to these, these fine folks this week, and one more round of applause for all they've done. So thank you guys.
Once again, I forgot to advance the damn slide. Okay, so scholarship winner, winners. Um, with that, um, I'm gonna invite Kim up, and Kim is gonna introduce our lunch speaker today. So Kim, come on up. Hello, everyone. Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna switch you up. Go ahead. Keep talking. I get the great honor and privilege of being able to introduce our director, my boss, John Baza. Um, I first met him in 2018. He is a petroleum engineer by training. He's been working on and off for the division since 1984, which is longer than I've been alive. He was appointed by the governor in 2005, and he has been with, um, he has seen a whole bunch of change throughout the years, and worse cannot describe how vital it is to have a boss that supports you and what you do with GIS that's interested in learning about what we do to be able to better communicate. He's always asking questions about how he can use this data. He's been to different things, talking to the public, um, operators, legislatures, politicians, any, he has, he has seen a plethora of people around. Um, and he has really supported us on getting us the tools that we need so that we can better do our jobs at the state to be able to ensure reclamation and public safety. Um, through our improvements with GIS, um, we've won the Esri SAG Award a couple years ago over the Esri User Conference, and I'm just really excited to have John here. So thank you, thank you for coming, and if there's any advice that you can give us to get more managers on board like you are, please tell us. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Kim. I really appreciate that introduction. And uh, I hope that what I can provide to you today is exactly what Kim was suggesting, is how do we get more senior leadership in all of our organizations on board with the idea of using GIS as a tool for their business processes? Well, let me first say that I'm very honored and flattered that I was invited to come and speak to you today. I was doing pretty good until I ran into Amber Knapp with Esri, and she said that you've had Jack Dangerman here before talking to you. Well, honestly, I'm no Jack Dangerman, and I, I really feel kind of overwhelmed by the fact that you had such a great speaker before, and now today you get me. But I want you to blame one particular person. I was invited to speak here by Tom Thompson. And I think we all know Tommy, he's a good guy. I like the heck out of that guy. But he invited me to speak, and then not too long after that he said, oh, I'm going on vacation that week. And so you have my permission to give Tommy Thompson a hard time about ditching me at the last minute so that I had to speak of this. But no, it, it, it's not a truly an obligation, it's, it's an opportunity. And so what I'm going to talk to you today about is integrating GIS into executive decision making. We've tried to do that in the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, and you'll, you'll see some slides that kind of walk you through that process. First of all, I want to tell you that as the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, we are a family of agencies within the State Department of Natural Resources. You can see our name there. Um, there's forestry, fire and state lands, parks, water resources, water rights, wildlife, and the Geological Survey. Yeah, shout out. Um, and as of last year, we acquired some new agencies in DNR. We split parks and recreation into Division of Parks and the Division of Recreation. So we have a new group leading up that Division of Recreation. We also acquired the Office of Energy Development and the Public Lands Policy Coordinating Office. We're still going through some growing pains with those agencies, but as you can see, we kind of run the spectrum of the natural resources in the state, how they're managed, how they're regulated, how we as state employees can guide policy in those areas. Specifically for the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, 
we have four key functions. Our oil and gas regulatory program is probably the oldest of the programs. It was established in 1955. The minerals regulatory program came along in the mid-70s, and then it split and became a coal regulatory program starting in early 1980s because we acquired a federal primacy program. So we still have coal regulatory and then non-coal regulatory, which is our minerals program. And then we also have an abandoned mine reclamation program, which is more of a hazard mitigation program. They go out and seal old legacy portals that were left standing by previous mining activities so that the public doesn't just encounter those or wander into them unexpectedly. Um, but there's a bunch of that to do. And frankly, the dollars available to do it won't even need, meet the need. But we chip away at it, and hopefully we are doing some good there. So what does it mean to be regulatory? We've got three regulatory programs, one non-regulatory program. I'm going to relate it back to a sport that I enjoy watching a lot, baseball. So as you're a kid, you realize it's best to play the game. You know, if we were looking at mining and extractive industries, it's funner to be involved in those industries actually getting product out of the ground. But it's OK to watch. Some people think it's boring. Baseball games can be long and tedious affairs. But no one really pays much attention, unless the umps make a bad call, about what the umps are doing, right? And not, not many kids aspire to be baseball umpires. So an example of this is, you know, those who know baseball, you probably know what the infield fly rule is. If you don't know baseball, who cares? But beyond the world of rules, and if we apply rules and the regulatory structure to the extractive industries, there are statistics. If you're a baseball fan, you want to know what the batter's uh, RBI is. You want to know their slugging percentage. You want to know a pitcher's ERA. And we enter the world of big data when we talk about statistics after the rules. So that's what we're involved in. We're also involved in that age of big data and its application to the mineral and petroleum extractive industries I'm going to show you in just a minute. We're also the information repository for all this data. You recognize the picture? It's the Raiders of the Lost Ark warehouse, right? That's kind of where we were before we started getting into a digital age. Um, we had a lot of paper records, and we've managed to convert over many of those paper records over time. But as we've converted that to digital information, we've had to learn how to manage that data, how to mine that data for trends and for things that are important for us to know how well we are regulating and how well those industries are doing in the state of Utah. This is a map you've seen before. It was created by our GIS analyst, Kat Schooley. And it's interesting to watch this map. It's interactive. It's a time lapse sort of thing. So you can see how the oil and gas industry in the state has grown over the last three decades or so. And right now, we're dealing with about nearly 17,000 active unplugged wells in the state. That's a lot of information to try to pay attention to. But we have to rely on GIS and mapping to help us understand that data in a better way. There are other statistics we keep track of in the oil and gas space. We, we worry about how many rigs are running, how many wells are commenced each month, what the production levels are, and even what the commodity price is. That is important to us because it indicates how well the state is going to receive benefit 
from this activity that's out there. This is another map that was created that is an internal tool for us. It was the oil and gas inspection prioritization module. And it allows us to say that based on various factors, time since last inspection, proximity to population and water, various geographic factors, we can prioritize each well with a category of inspection so that we know if it's red, our inspectors need to get out there and visit that fairly soon. It's been a great tool for our field staff because if they're in an area witnessing another operation, like a plug-in abandonment, they can say, well, I've got several well, red wells in this immediate area. I can go down and do that during my off time on this operation. And I can take care of that right away. And we've done great work in terms of minimizing the number of priority one wells that we have to deal with on a periodic basis. It's been a great tool. We also have minerals that we track in the state. And just like the oil and gas interactive map, we have minerals interactive map. Minerals are pretty darn important to us because they occur in all 29 counties of the state. And those operations have occurred through history, going back to maybe even the mid 1850s. So we've got a lot of tracking we have to do. There's probably over 600 active operating mines, both large and small in the state, all the way from the big pit in the Salt Lake Valley to the small landscape stone operations that we have to deal with from time to time. Adding that all up, we rank on a national basis seventh in mining value. And you've heard a little bit about critical minerals. These are the minerals that, that our government has deemed as important to national security or for energy or for other reasons. The things like lithium or beryllium. Those things, there are 25 of the known categorized uh, 30 or so critical minerals that occur in the state of Utah. So again, a lot of data to pay attention to and keep track of. <clears throat> but let me explain to you my own personal GIS journey. I, I am not a knowledgeable GIS person, but I really appreciate it. And back in the early 2000s, I became acquainted with the basic mapping applications. You know them. Things like Google Earth and the ability to put a street map up on your computer or your phone. Well, it was around April of 2011 that I attended a conference back east. And I learned about a federal government application called GeoMine, specifically for coal. And the federal government was trying to catalog all the underground coal, coal mines in the United States and map them. It's surprising that that hadn't been done before, but they were trying to get this information in a digital framework. And most states were like Utah. In 2011, we were still relying a lot on paper records. So this concept of a computer application that would help us understand underground coal mining better was really fascinating to me. So I talked to the fellow who presented the, the information to us. And he said, you know, if you're interested in this, you need to go to an ESRI users conference. He said, by the way, as a federal employee, I can get you in on my ticket. So I was able to go to that users conference in July of 2011. But one of the most valuable things I did was they have a Sunday session, which they call the senior executive session, in which I actually experienced uh, Jack Dangerman up close and personal. And we, we 
we learn from that. I learned from that experience. And I've got another slide that talks about that a little bit more. But it was probably around August of 2017 that we hired Tommy Thompson. We included him as part of our senior management team in the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. And we realized that by doing so, we were allowing him to recognize how his role as a GIS analyst fit in to our business processes. <laughs> so the lesson I learned from experiencing Esri that first time, everything is geospatial. It's not just the data and the mines and the activity that we have as a regulatory agency. You could even say that our financial records could tie to a geospatial situation. You could even say that uh, our public outreach, where we go out and educate people about what we do, had a geospatial component to it. And it was by listening to Jack Dangerman in that first session that I realized we could apply this across the board in our division. And that's why when we hired Tommy, we said, you're going to be part of our management team. We've identified six critical business processes of the division. The first three apply to our regulatory programs, inspection, compliance, and enforcement, our applications and permit approval, and our data collection, mainly reporting from the operators, and the record keeping associated with that. We also have the abandoned mine reclamation program, which is a bit different as a business process. It's a hazard mitigation program, but it, it relies on a different way of doing business than our regulatory programs do. Our board of oil, gas, and mining is a different business process. They have to have monthly hearings and adjudicate and to sit, make decisions on you know, does this operator get what, we, what they want, or does this operator? And sometimes it's pretty complex and, and tedious, much like a courtroom. But even that has a geospatial application. And then we have our administration, which is across the board on all of our programs. But the thing that I'm wanting to explain to you is by, number one, including Tommy in our senior management meetings, he was able to appreciate all of these business processes and what we were hoping to achieve with them. What were our metrics? What were our strategies? How can we improve each of those business processes? And then also by um, having him participate on our management team, all of our senior managers were able to say, hey, I like that idea. Why don't we do it this way? Why don't we provide you with some support so that our staff can be engaged with you as a GIS professional? It's been a great win-win for both the people who work in GIS and the business managers in our division. I'm going to close with a slide. And a lot of you recognize this. I, uh, I was a teenager in the late 60s, early 70s. I was a big fan of Star Trek. And uh, I can remember watching the show, and my dad would walk in the room and say, what is this BS? You know, I don't get it. And I said, Dad, this is great. This is the future. And I've tried to tell people over time that if you think back on the old television program of Star Trek. What have we got these days? We've got doors that open when you walk up to them. We've got personal communicators that allow us to talk and interact with people around the world. We have medical devices that scan us for diseases. So what we've learned is that the realm of science fiction is not fiction anymore. So as we look ahead, I think you're going to see the growth in GIS and the applications just proliferate because 
like the World Wide Web, when it first started, people dabbled in it. They didn't really understand it. But who can go a day or even an hour these days without connecting to the internet and doing something on the internet? So my advice to you is, in any of the organizations you work in, engage yourself with your organizational leader. Help him understand that you can be of benefit to them in terms of the business processes he's hoping to achieve. And let him know that you are truly indispensable in terms of the knowledge that you have as GIS professionals. He won't know any of this stuff, but you do. And the ability to create tools and dashboards and metrics from the data are going to be vital to him. So my last piece of advice is let's boldly go where no one's gone before. Let's dream of innovative things we can do with GIS and make suggestions that are going to help our organizations become better. Some of the, this is the last slide. This is just our contact information for myself and our two deputies in the division. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'd love to interact with you more and know what your hopes and dreams are in terms of using GIS in different ways. The times I have gone to Esri UC, I've always learned something new, and my eyes have been opened to how we can apply GIS, even in the most simplest of ways. So I really appreciate your time today. I'm honored and flattered that you asked me to be here. And that's all I've got. So I hope, uh, hope you have a great rest of this lunch and enjoy the awards and keep in touch. Thank you. John very much. It's really interesting to hear from a director how GIS has been incorporated. And John, from all of us in organizations, we really appreciate your vision and understanding of GIS and willingness to go on that GIS journey. It makes it a lot easier for everyone working in those divisions to have a really supportive director. So thank you very much. And we have a thank you gift for you. Sorry, just let me switch to here. Okay. So the next section we're going into are the awards for the poster competitions. And, and how many of you attended Iron Cartography? Yeah. It was a great battle between Roger Dunn and Michelle Barragona, and Michael Philp had some wonderful commentary for that. And I think every time I anyone attends Iron Cartographer, you learn new tip, uh, tips and tricks, and it, this year was no exception to that. And so the winner of Iron Cartographer is Michelle Barragona, the reigning champ. So come on up, Michelle. So this is Michelle's second win in a row, so any of you who want to battle her next year, she's going to be going for the tripe. Another decoration, another year for her office of the trophy. <laughs> now switching into the different categories for the posters is the web map. The winner of the web map application is Holly Way from Carbon County. And I don't think she's here, so Melissa Laszlo will accept on her. Uh, Melissa Campbell will accept on her. Yeah. Sorry, Melissa. The next category is professional map. 
and Buck Eeler from the Division of Wildlife Resources. I wish, I wish somebody else would have entered something. <laughs> so we, for next year, we really want to have lots of posters, but Buck, we did a really nice uh, job on the Lake Bonneville. For the student map competition, the winner is Julia Circus from the University of Utah doing a Tri-Canyon Trails plan. And I know she is not here, but we'll send it home with Josh Grunevelt, maybe. So, thank you, Julia. And our next category is Map as Art, and I think this is the first year where we had more, except for the student competition, more entries into Map as Art than any other category. So. I think that's really awesome is that these categories that were new just a few years ago now have lots of entries in them. And the winner of Map is Art is Joy Kasky, Division of Wildlife Resources. Now I'm going to bring up Stan Machinsky to award the Machinsky Award. So the Machinsky Award is basically um, an award highlighting exceptional map creation and creativity. And um, this year we are awarding it to Jordan Merrill from Uinta County. Sean's up next. All right, we always give out awards for the mini golf. We're going to start with the one who did the worst. The dead last winner is <laughs> Idar Charles. Third place, Jordan Merrill. Second place, Tom Toronto. Is, he here? Is Tom not here? All right. And first place, Carl Fenrich. All right, 
We had cornhole for the first time this year. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for everyone who participated. I know I had a lot of fun even though I didn't do very well, but we had some winners. Jordan Merrill and Kendall Allen. I always get the fun part, so that's this will be fun for everybody to kind of come around. But before we get started here, we did. Uh, there was a couple vendor uh, special prizes that they kind of had their own little drawing for, and so I'm going to start with. This is all from uh, Elements, and third prize went to Kevin uh, Andra. And there you go. Second prize is Tulson. Where is he? I see him. Is he here? Oh, there you are. Ah. It's always good to get toys for uh, prizes. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, first prize is Ken Richards. Yay. And then I want to uh, call up from Gateway Mapping, Danica. We have the results of our uh, Geography Trivia Challenge that we've been running at our Gateway Mapping booth all week. Um, stop by next year because we've got some fun ideas as well for that if you missed out. Um, but our winner of the $50 gift card this year was Mark Beatty. All right, we're gonna get moving here now with a. Okay, here's here's the here's the plan. We're gonna we've got uh, five major prizes, or better ones, and then a, a bunch of really cool prizes too. So um, they're all really cool. We're just gonna say that they're all really cool, but we're gonna we're gonna call five of them really good ones. And so the first person we're gonna we're gonna pick out, and then they're gonna pick the the, the five prizes. Well, actually six, because they'll put the next person as well. So yeah, go ahead. Okay, and, and this is for the classic, classic Dutch oven. Ben, Benjamin Smith. Yeah, here. So, um, if you if if any of you guys don't get one of these five, it's Benjamin's fault. Because he's picking them.
we do. Yeah, we got we have one new one or two. We got to have the new one. Too. So the winner, this this is just a regular prize. Kelly Green. You got to pick the next person. Announce what we're. Oh, oh yeah, okay. So this is a, a lovely ESRI bag, a, a, Na a National Geographic hiking map, and as well as. The vendor cups, Stanley cups. Valina Peterson. Mention that these maps were provided by DNR. And all these maps were donated by DNR. David Evans. Another map and a very cool UGIC coffee or hot chocolate bug. Either way. your name you don't get a win. <laughs> Pendenship. Okay, I'm going to go with Bailey, but it's going to be uh, Benke. It's like B-A-N-K-Y. <laughs> I don't know what I say. <laughs> Bailey Banks. Oh, Banks. Bailey Banks. Bailey Banks. I apologize. <laughs> 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 Remember your fourth grade when we learned how to write. A ripped up version. Cat Schooly. Casey Sledge. We're moving on to the all purpose chef set by Camp Chef. Brian Bush. The next gift is a solo stove. Kevin Sato. Uh, the next the next gift was donated by Monson Engineering. So, Tom, if you if you've went and talked to Tom, but he also wants to plug Jason Monson, who started a new plotting and, and printing company. So there's a card for both of those, just for you guys to know. <laughs> Tulsa. 
Yep. The next, uh, the next gift is a water bag, and it actually is from Tom as well from Monson. Bruce Cheney. This is a large cast iron skillet. Any, any problems? Just right there. Jonathan Harmon. Mark Beatty. Beatty. <clears throat> Jesse Shapiro. And if I butcher your names, you know, I'll be here all week, so here we go. <laughs> Adrian Welsh. Professional flat, flat top griddle, Camp Chef. Camp Chef was one of our vendor, our supporters, so sponsorship, so. <laughs> Josh Gregory. Where's Josh? Where is he? Josh. Josh. Josh? Yeah. <laughs> He's going, that wasn't my last name. I don't know what you say. <laughs> Nathan Mendenhall. So Veritas GIS donated that, plus we've added in a very valuable UGIC mug. So. Jordan Merrill. Yeah. So, so the final five here, um, I, I guess the best way to do this is you have to be here for one, and and then you pick from the five, the first first one we pull out here, and then we'll just go in order. Okay. So, um, so we've got the deluxe barbecue grill box. We've got the, is that a can, it's a portable little stove. We've got the uh, camp shift portable um, grill, barbecuer. And then we got the pro box, the full, full thing right there too. Oh, and thanks to Melissa here, this is all being donated as well. So you can actually take this thing with you. Big foam or cornhole? Cornhole. All right, we're well, here. You go, Stephen Light. Stephen Light. 
Oh. Zenchin. Zenchin. Jason Thurlow. Kendall Allen. That is it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, any other announcements? Yeah. The final words, Stan. Uh, yeah, you want to? I'm going to pass it along to Stan for the final words. But uh, thanks so much for everybody. Thanks for all the vendors who help support us. It's very helpful to make this actually run smoothly and be a, allow us to afford some of the things that we're doing. So thank you. Well, that about sums it up right there. Thanks, guys, for coming. We don't know where we're going next year. Probably somewhere along the Wasatch Front. Not sure yet where. So stay tuned for more information there. Um, I think we're all done. And enjoy the rest of your time here in Dinosaur area. And drive home safely. Thanks for coming.